Okay, let's get started here. So project number three is due on Friday at noon. Um, and we will continue in the um, chapter three today. Are there any questions? Okay, so we left off last time about page 325. <clears throat> so we're talking about multinomial regression models. These are good kinds of models to use when your response variable obviously is um, multinomial or multi-category, let's say, um, in nature. And uh, you don't necessarily have any kind of ordering amongst the categories. So category two is not necessarily greater than category one in any particular way. Um, so this is what a multinomial regression model looks like written in terms of p explanatory variables. So we're modeling the log odds again, just like what we did in chapter two. So for now, we have to specify, well, which categories are you comparing? So the way that this model is written is that you're comparing category j to category one. So the odds of observing category j versus the, uh, I'm sorry, the odds of observing category j versus category one. And we allow that we allow these probabilities, this odds also, to vary as a function of explanatory variables. So in this case, we have p different explanatory variables, <coughs> and then to measure essentially the effect that that explanatory variable has on the odds, we use these regression parameters, these betas. Now notice with these betas here, they have a subscript j on them. And so what that's basically going to mean that for every pi j divided by pi 1 comparison, you're going to have a different set of regression parameters. Notice little j here goes from 2 to capital J. So the, you know, the first subscript here, uh, the first time around, you can say it's going to be 2. And so you know, what we're, what, what we're used to when we write out a, a regression model, you just have one equation. Here we will have j minus one equations for this one overall model. Okay. Now let's consider the case where we have just one explanatory variable to make things simple. So we just maybe have up to x1. And let's just call x to be simple also. Let's try to find what pi sub j would be. Now, when we were looking at logistic regression models, you know, we easily can move from a logit of pi is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x to pi is equal to e raised to the beta 0 plus beta 1 times x divided by 1 plus e raised to the linear combination of the betas with the x's. Now, since we have more than two categories like what we had in chapter 2, now, uh, you know, it's not as easy to move to just talk about pi sub j itself. So the first, things that, first thing that you would do then is, well, let's move this log essentially over to the other side. So the way that we do that is that we use the exponential function. I'll just put an e there, how about? Okay, so then that removes the log, and you're left with pi j divided by pi 1. Some more algebra, we can move this pi 1 over to the other side so that now we multiply by pi 1. And that's what we get right here. Okay, so now we have an expression for pi sub j. But we would like to be able to express this so that it's only a function of the betas and the x's, not pi 1 there. And the way that we do that is we take into account the fact that you know, the sum of these probabilities here, these pi's, has to be equal to 1. Okay? Please make that small little change in your notes. It should be, I, I think I missed a subscript. So it was a 2 0 there, and also a J 0 where you see the blue highlights. So J 0 should be 2 0. No. I missed a 2 0, I believe, here, and I missed a J 0. I think maybe I just have a 0. I do have it right? Oh, little, I have little J. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. 
So I have little j's. So change the little j's to what they should be. OK. So we take into account that these pi's have to sum to 1. Let's write out then what these pi's are in terms of our model. Well, first pi 1, and then you have pi 2. How did I get this? I'm sticking a 2 in there for j. Do the same thing for pi 3, and I go all the way up to pi sub capital J. Again, how do I get that value? By just sticking a capital J in there for the lowercase j. Now notice what these terms all have in common. Pi 1. Let's factor out pi 1. Let me do some erasing. So I factor out pi 1. So I get 1 plus e to the beta 2, 0 plus beta 2, 1 times x plus dot 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 plus um, e raised to the beta capital J 0 plus beta capital J 1 times x. That's equal to 1. So then what I'm going to do, so that I just have pi 1 on the left side, I'm going to take that stuff that's in brackets, move it over to the right side, and now I have a nice little expression for pi 1. Okay, so I found what pi 1 is. I like to find what pi 2 is, what pi 3 is, and so on. Now it's easy. All I do is I plug that pi 1, that expression, up into our expression that we had for pi sub j. And then what do I get? Pi sub j for little j equal 2 to capital J is this expression there. That's it. I have asked students to derive that on a test before. Or to go through what I just did here. So that's how you can come up with an expression for the pi's. Are there any questions? Okay. Now that I have the, pr the expression for the pi's, I can now talk about how do we estimate the betas. Because now I have a way to link each of the pi's to a beta, and now I can find, uh, I can use my likelihood function. Plug in the expression in terms of the betas, wherever you see a pi, maximize that likelihood function. But what is my likelihood function? Well, this goes back to page 3.3 .3 of the notes. You might remember there was four questions that I asked you there about what would the likelihood function look like in certain situations. And so I asked you specifically if you had, let's say, M sets of multinomial observations, what would the likelihood function look like? Well, basically, just take that, and wherever you see a pi, plug in the pi that you saw basically right up here. Okay, now you have your likelihood function in terms of the betas. Maximize it as a function of the betas. As you might expect, there's not like a nice little close form solution, so you're going to have to use numerical iterative methods, just like what we did with logistic regression, to find what the maximum likelihood estimates would be. Fortunately, you don't have to do it by hand. And so there's a multinome function in R that does it automatically for you. Um, this function is in the NN, it's in the NNET package. It has nothing to do with Nat, uh, Nebraska Educational Television. What it has to do with is neural networks. I don't, and I don't really necessarily know the connection or understand completely the connection between neural networks and these multinomial regression models. But the person who wrote the function, his name is Brian Ripley, one of the big people in R, uh, he's found the connection and he just simply uses that connection to find to do the maximum likelihood estimation. Could one do the maximum likelihood estimation doing something else? Yes. In fact, there's an exercise in my book that does that. Um, you can take a look at it if you want. Uh, but that's, that's why this multinome function is in the neural network package. This package is automatically installed in R, but if you want to use functions from it, you have to first say library and any T. N -N -E -T -N. Okay. Well, what about a covariance matrix for the beta hats? Well, that just comes about through applying regular old maximum likelihood estimation stuff. So 
If you remember, we saw that in chapter one. In chapter two, in terms of the logistic regression model, um, you know, we said, well, now you have to take the negative of the expected value of the second partial derivative of the log likelihood function, evaluate it at the parameter estimates. That's what's done here. Fortunately, there's a function R that automatically does it for us. What is that function? V cove, yes. And so you just say, you know, you fit your model using multinom, say the results in, let's say, mod.fit, and then say V cove, parentheses, mod.fit, and parentheses, you get your co estimated covariance matrix. You can also do walled and likelihood ratio based inferences as well, uh, using, you know, what you would expect from what we've seen in chapter two. And we'll see some examples coming up. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So this is my wheat kernel data example. Um, this actually comes about through a, um, uh, a consulting project that I worked on when I was a student. I was working with a person who was in the Department of Grain Science at Kansas State University. And what he was interested in was to try to develop some kind of automated method that would help wheat producers understand the quality of their wheat kernels. So there was three categories that are used. Healthy, kernels healthy, looks good, you make good flour. Uh, sprout, uh, of course these kernels are seeds, so they can sprout, start growing. It's gonna lead to not as a high of quality um, uh, wheat if you were to produce wheat, or um, flour if you were to produce, produce flour from it. And then scab, which is actually a kernel that's exhibiting disease symptoms. So he wanted to come up with an automated method instead of, let's say, someone looking at them, you know, with, with their eyes, mm, is that healthy scab or sprout? An automated method that would help make this determination. And um, so what he did, he took a sample of 275 kernels, and he had someone look at them to make that judgment of healthy scab or sprout. Then he put it into this, essentially, we'll just call the machine, that would help make that determination uh, for someone, okay? So that a human didn't have to actually look at each kernel. And this machine, what it did was it measured a whole bunch of stuff about each kernel. It measured the density, hardness, size, weight, and moisture content. Also with each of these kernels, one would know if it was uh, from soft red winter wheat or hard red winter wheat. So we have essentially six explanatory variables here, and we want to use these six explanatory variables to try to estimate the probability of falling in the healthy sprout or scab categories. That's our goal. So the data is in week.csv. And I can read it into my um, uh, uh, R using simply the read dot dot read.csv function, and this is what the data looks like. So for the first observation, it was hard red winter wheat, and there's the density, there's the hardness, size, weight, moisture content. An individual, an actual person, observed it to be healthy. And so again, the purpose is, is that through using these explanatory variable values, this machine gets this. Then one would like to be able to predict is this healthy, is this sprout, is this scab? Hopefully, it gets it right and predicts this particular observation is healthy. Here's a what's called a parallel coordinate plot that graphs the data. So let me make this a little bit bigger. My computer is slowing down for some reason. I don't know why. There we go. I would imagine that probably a lot of you have seen these parallel coordinates plots before. They're a great way to graph multivariate data um, in terms of where you have multiple variables, which we do here. And this is how you understand the plot. Uh, so let's take a look at density here. There we go. And you can kind of see, although it's kind of a light gray, you can see basically a, a vertical axis here. And you can see some lines crossing the vertical axis. This line crossing at the very, very bottom 
represents the kernel that had the lowest density value. The line, the green line crossing at the top represents a kernel that had the highest density value. And then all the other 273 kernels are spaced between these two kernels in a relative manner to what their density values are. One way to think about it is that all the data is rescaled to a 0, 1 scale. <coughs> Zero being the lowest density value, one being the highest density value. So this is done for density, it's done for hardness, it's done for all the variables. And then for the exact same kernel, lines are drawn to connect the corresponding points that will be uh, plotted. So for example, the smallest hardness kernel has a density value that's kind of small as well. Also, the hardness for, for that kernel goes up to, oh, probably around here. And you can follow, there are ways to do this, and I'm, we're not going to get into the details here. There are ways that you could follow every kernel throughout the entire plot. One other aspect that I added to this plot was that I put, um, uh, I color-coded the lines corresponding to the uh, wheat type, or yeah, let's call it type, healthy sprout or scout. And so what can you see in this plot? Do you see trends? Yeah, you see a lot of the greens that have low density values, low size values, low weight values. So it seems like scab kernels tend to be, relatively speaking, lower in value for those uh, than sprout and healthy. Also, you could take a look at healthy up here. Notice how the black lines seem to be a little bit higher for density. Now, that doesn't happen for every single kernel, no. But generally speaking, we see a trend. When you see trends like that, that might make you think, OK, some of these explanatory variables might be important for predicting healthy sprout or scab. So that's why it's always good to look at your data first to get an initial impression before then you go into the actual statistical modeling. So it's a parallel coordinate plot. I'm not going to ask you a question on a test regarding how to do these plots. If you want to see the code, take a look at my program. And also, you can take Steady at 73, where we do talk about the details. OK, let's see here. So this is the model that I want to estimate. The log of pi j divided by pi 1 is equal to, now this linear combination of the betas with the x's. The x's are going to be our six explanatory variables. So like the density, the hardness. Also, I'm going to have the cl class of the wheat. Is it hard red winter wheat or soft red winter wheat? Since there are three levels to our response, that means I'm going to have essentially two, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, two, uh, I guess, regression equations. Well, what should we pick for j equal 1, 2, and 3? Well, in the end, it doesn't really matter because you're going to come up with the same overall conclusions, but you have to pick something. And this is what R does, and this is what we will do then throughout the rest of the, this course. And that is it draws back to what we talked about in Chapter 2 whenever you had a qualitative variable. If you remember, we said you could look at the levels of the qualitative variable by using the levels function. And so if you notice here, when I do that with the type variable, which contains the three wheat types, look at the ordering, healthy, scab, and sprout. Puts in the alphabetical order. So the first one there, healthy, that's going to be j equal 1. Sprout, uh, scab is going to be j equal 2. Sprout is going to be j equal 3. R does this modeling. That's what it's going to use. Of course, you can change that if you wanted to, by using, for example, the factor function or the read level function that we talked about in chapter two. Okay, so let's estimate the model. So first of all, I have to say library NNET, and then I use the multi-known function to estimate the model. Uh, I'm sorry, I should mention, so I think this was kind of poor. So x1 is going to be the class, soft red winter wheat or hard red winter wheat. So hard red, hard red winter wheat is represented by hrw. Soft red winter wheat is srw. 
So how will R handle that in a model? It's going to have to create an indicator variable. And an indicator variable is going to be a one for what? Soft red winter wheat. Because it puts in alphabetical order, HRW comes before SRW. Okay. X6 then corresponds to moisture. Okay. So, multinome formula equal, just like what we did with the GLM function. Put your response type. Remember that this type is a factor. Then put in your explanatory variables, the six of them. Specify where your data is. That's all. Put the results into mod.fit. You get some information about uh, model convergence. It says it has converged. There are some issues that you have to look for here, just like what we talked about with respect to logistic regression models, and we'll talk about some of those later. And then I say summary mod.fit, and here's a summary of my model fit. So, j equal 2, j equal 3, scab and sprout. So, this scab row is going to compare scab, so it's going to be basically high of scab divided by high of healthy, in terms of when we think about the model. The intercept here, the, the intercept column, tells us that this is beta hat two zero. Underneath the class SRW, notice how R takes into account that this is going to be indicator variable representing SRW. This is going to be beta hat two one. The 19.16 in the sprout row is beta hat three zero. So based upon that, then you can write out your estimated model. And this is what I actually do on page 330. Okay. Let's also look at some more at the output here. The standard errors. So this 4.289 represents the estimated, the square root of the estimated variance of beta hat 2.0. We have a residual deviance. We talked about residual deviances before. Same thing here. We have an AIC. We'll talk about AIC in chapter five. Okay, so, so we have this estimated model. And again, you're going to write out two equations to fully write out the model. You know, a very easy question on a test will be for me to ask you to uh, estimate the model, which means then you use multinome, and then you actually write it out. Okay. Now that we have this, we can basically do a lot of the same things that we've been doing in Chapter 2. And so because of that, rather than me just illustrating exactly every single thing in the notes, we're going to do this more interactively. And I'm going to ask you questions about how would you do this? And then we'll look at some of the stuff actually in R shortly. Okay, so question number one. How would you perform a wall test for beta JR? So in other words, I like to test something like this. So if I come back up to my output here, suppose we focus on that corresponding beta hat. Suppose I want to do a test for the corresponding beta using a walled statistic. What would be that walled statistic? Z is equal to... How about negative 0.648? Divided by the standard error. Yep, divided by the standard error, 0.663. So what do you think? Would you reject or don't reject? Don't reject, because notice that the value is going to be approximately equal to 1, or negative 1. That's going to be between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Okay. 
Okay, so that's how you could do a walled test. Why do you think that doing a walled test like this is probably not going to be of interest, though? Because you're not taking consideration the other factors. You're not what? You're taking in consideration the other covariates or the other variables in the model. Um, perhaps I think I know, well, I think I know what you're, what you're saying. Let me just restate it. And maybe I might be wrong. You know, in order to represent the class variable in the, in the model itself, there's not just one beta, there's two. Is that what you were trying to get at? No. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that's actually what I said then was the correct answer. Uh, thank you for, though, for offering that an answer. Uh, you know, what, in order to really test class, or maybe to test density, or test hardness, since we have a, a essentially two equations that represent our model here, we actually have to take into account all the betas that correspond to that particular explanatory variable. So a wall test like I just we just talked about, generally speaking, wouldn't be of interest. And that's probably why you don't see in the output, unlike what we did with GLM, the wall test automatically given. So let's say that I did want to test this. So beta 2, 1 is equal to beta 3, 1 is equal to 0 versus not all of them are equal to 0. So that's testing class itself. Name a test that you would use to do this. T-test. Nope, not T-test. ANOVA? Well, you would use the ANOVA function to do that, and you would use a Likert ratio test then as the way to do the test. So you could use the little ANOVA function. You could use the capital ANOVA function as well. Let's take a look at an example in my program. Let's see here. Oops, I'm in the wrong program. Oh, sometimes my programs get too long. Let's make, let's make sure that I get the right model going on here. There we go. Okay. So one thing that you could do is go to the car package, you use the capital Nova function, and you run that with mod.fit. And we can see, for example, with class, the negative 2 log lambda is 0.964, p value is 0.6175, very high, suggesting there's not sufficient evidence that class is indeed uh, important. Notice the degrees of freedom there is 2, because we're testing 2 betas. That's the test that. Class is not important, but not that there's a difference in the effect of class. It's testing overall for any of the categories for a response. Does the class matter? So if you reject HO, yes, you have found that it matters. If you don't reject HO, that says, well, at least from this sample, there's not sufficient evidence to indicate it matters. So notice I would never say it doesn't matter. You can never conclude HO is true in a hypothesis. Well, what, what variables are important that we have evidence for? Density, hardness. Density, we, hardness, and weight. We, well, we have density, we have maybe hardness, and we have weight. Okay. Now let's go back to that plot that we saw earlier. Oops. Okay, so we said density, weight, sorry, and hardness. Obviously, with respect to density, we can see that. Weight, we can see that as well. Hardness, well, that might be a little bit more difficult to see. But I think the hardness p-value was kind of marginal to begin with. Um, let's take a look at size. What was the p-value for that? Well, I mean, it's a little low, but not maybe as low as what we would expect from that plot. But at least we're, 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 we're able to see some stuff that we would expect. 
Um, you know, one problem with this kind of a plot too is that note that you know, depending upon the ordering of the observations in the data set, some lines will be overlapping other lines. And so uh, oftentimes, especially in this kind of a study, it's nice to do the plot by reordering the observations. And there's other interactive ways to, to deal with a plot like this. Too. You can see in study 73 um, that would maybe help you um, uh, see why we're concluding what we're concluding. Can you, can you plot like a, a line of the average with error bar? Uh, yeah, you could. Error. Uh, well, hold on. You would basically have to write your own function to do that. Um, and the way to do that is just take the function that's already in R and then just add some code to it. Uh, the problem is, is um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, you could, it's just going to take a little bit more work. Okay, also, to do this test, what we could do is use the little ANOVA function. So how about if I fit the model under the null hypothesis, and notice you do not see class in there. And then I can use the little ANOVA function by comparing the model under HO versus just the mo model without the restriction, and of course we get exactly the same value for a p-value. Okay. So I have a question here. Sure. So when you asked that question back then, I, I guess I misunderstood you. I understood what he said because you said to compare, I was thinking you were, you were comparing the beta hat for class between scab and sprout model, not comparing the effect of the beta hat overall for class, for the class variable. Well, okay, so we were, we were the, the beta that we were talking about was comparing scab, scab to healthy, mm -hmm. okay, and so we were only doing a test for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so page three thirty one. Okay, how can we estimate and are the probability of healthy for the first observation? Let me do a little split screen action here. Oops, went too far. So at the beginning of class, we talked about how to come up with pi. And so, for example, for pi 1, which would be healthy, so here's pi 1, the actual expression um, in the bottom portion of my split screen. Above here is pi hat 1. And so, you know, you just take 1 over 1 plus e raised to, and then you put the beta hats in there, corresponding to where you see the summation symbol right here. And if you go through all the math, you get 0.8552. Okay? I like to be able to do this more automatically in R. So what function R do you think would do this automatically? Predict. Predict, yeah. You know, and remember, this is what we talked about earlier in Chapter 2 about how R is set up. You know, we have these method functions. We have these generic functions. And the reason why we have that is so you can use the same language, whether you're working with a logistic regression model, multinomial regression model. Later we'll look at a Poisson regression model. You're always using the same language with your functions. So we can use the predict function to predict. Let me go to my program to show you that. So if I want to find my pi hats, I use predict, object equal, mod.fit, new data. That's what I want to, in terms of uh, what um, explanatory variable values I want to predict at. How about we just put in the observed data itself. You know, if I didn't want to do the observed data, suppose I had some other, maybe I had a new kernel and I wanted to predict, I would just simply create a data frame, put in the variable values in that data frame, and put that in there for new data. And then there's an argument called type. Type equal probs for probabilities. That's what I want to see out. I'm going to use the hat, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the head function with pi dot hat, and here are my estimated probabilities. Okay. So for healthy, the first uh, uh, kernel has an pro estimated probability of 0.85, 5, 2. For scab, it's about 0 0.05, and for sprout, it's about 0.10. So we can see that there's a lot of probability on that healthy. Let's say that you want to do a classification here. 
Suppose I want to use this information to classify the, the sprout, uh, the sprout, classify the kernel as healthy scab or sprout. How would you do it? Just look at these estimated probabilities. Healthy has the highest estimated probability, so categorize this as a healthy. That's your predicted classification. In STAT 873, our multivariate analysis course, that's the purpose that we will look at in terms of, because we will also look at multinomial regression model, that will be the purpose. Here, our purpose is to get these probabilities and also understand the effect that explanatory variables have on the response. An automatic way to do these classifications, change the probs value to class for classify. And if I take a look at that, the first six, notice the first observation is classified as healthy. In fact, all the first six are classified as healthy because the highest probability corresponds to healthy always for the first six. Now, in my program itself, I show you how you can do some of these calculations in R, basically inputting the equations yourself. Please make sure you can do that. You know, on, on the next uh, project or even on a test. I could ask you some question about that. So don't just necessarily rely on predict to do everything. You need to know how predict works. Okay. Uh, so the bottom page 31 now. What does head of mod.fit dollar sign fitted dot values do. So what do you think this is going to do? It's going to give me my first six observations. Yes, it's going to give me my high hats. So just like what we saw with predict, we get those. You know, when we were working with the GLM function before, if you remember, there was a fitted dot values component that you would get out. So you, get the pro you can get the probabilities for your observed data this way too. Page 332, uh, we've already kind of talked about that. Let me remove the split first. Oops. How would you estimate the covariance matrix in print and R? You use VCOV, yes. Seven, um, how w could you include some type of transformation of explanatory variable in the model? So let's say, for example, I wanted density squared, how would I include it in the model? Do I do density caret sign 2 only? I use the I function with it. So I would say I density caret sign 2 include the other variables of interest as well in the formula argument, and that's how you would do it. You know, how would you do interactions? Just like what we did in chapter 2 colons, asterisks, for example. Okay, let's talk about some comments here. Now unfortunately, MC profile, that package does not work for Likert ratio based inference methods here. Uh, that's really too bad, so we're going to have to rely on walled stuff. Now I think it would be of interest then uh, for someone to develop maybe a package that would work with this and would do these Likert ratio uh, methods. Well, so we talked about how to predict pi. Well, what about confidence intervals for pi? You know, after all, you know, in chapter two, we were interested in confidence intervals for pi when we had the two category problem. Well, what about now three or more categories here? Unfortunately, predict that function doesn't give us a way to do it. Um, well, why? Well, let's say uh, you, you, can, you can do confidence intervals essentially one at a time for each of the pies. And so, for example, my program shows how to do this calculation and get these 95% intervals for the first observation. Make sure you take a look at the, uh, the, um, uh, the book and, and the um, uh, program.
Now, here's the problem. So I have a range for each of these pi's here, right? Could it be possible that the sum of these pi's was greater than 1? Based upon what you see for the interval range. Yeah. You know, just simply take a look at the upper bounds. Sum them up. Greater than 1. Uh-oh. That's a problem. Because we know that these probabilities actually have to sum up to 1. So while it's nice to be able to do this, and I've given you the tools to do this. I'm not going to ask you a question on a test, though, how to do this. I've given you the tools, maybe on a project one. Um, well, it's nice to be able to do this. This is not necessarily ideal. What would be ideal? Okay, sorry, is that the world? Yes. What would be ideal? Well, <clears throat> What will be ideal is to do what's called a confidence region. So you've all heard of confidence intervals before, but you might not have heard of confidence regions before. So let's say that I have on my y-axis possible values of pi scab, x-axis possible values of pi healthy. And what a confidence region may look like is something like this. So you have a 95% probability, uh, not probability, excuse me, 95% confidence level that the true values of pi scab and pi healthy are within that range, or within that region, I should say. That's a confidence region. Now you might be wondering, well, what about sprout? Am I just leaving sprout out? No, because remember that the sum of these pi's add up to 1. So pi sprout would be 1 minus pi healthy. It's spell healthy, pi scab. So that's how you get the third one. And this region will be drawn in a particular way, and I should have put it on a scale here. This region will be drawn in a particular way such that what your values of pi are you cannot, let's say, go above one in terms of the sum. That's a confidence region. This is a more difficult problem than doing those one at a time intervals. Unfortunately, I know of no package in R that will do a, a region like this. Maybe you know this is something that a student could work on in terms of come up with a, package, uh, um, a function that does this. Um, but the problem, too, is, well, let's say we just don't have three categories. Suppose you have four categories. Now that confidence region becomes now basically a 3D, uh, maybe like uh, almost like an ellipsoid. What happens if you have five categories? Well, good luck. You know, now you can't look at it. You know, you can't plot it. And it's going to be harder to write, write out then, too, and actually see it. Well, I can see it in an equation form. Um, and so that's why you know, this hasn't really been explored, because essentially you're almost limited to just three categories of finding these confidence regions. But you know, there probably could be some work done, further work done on this. So uh, I'm trying to picture that. So what values would the values on the x-axis and the y-axis? So you know you might be saying, okay, uh, you know you're you're saying, okay, this is a particular value where maybe this might be 0.4, this might be 0.3, let's say, mm -hmm. then that means pi sprout would be 0.3. That would be an acceptable possible value in your region. So just like how we talked about first of all, like when we were talking about um, profile likelihood ratio intervals, we said the set of possible values of pi that satisfy this equation would be within your interval. Well, the set of possible values of pi that's within that shaded region there would be within your region, confidence region. Did I answer your question? Maybe not? I don't think so. You think so? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't for sure if you said no, I didn't. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So the way that I did those one at a time intervals, like I said, I'm not going to test you on it. Uh, basically, um, I use a direct application of the delta method. The delta method is explained in the in Appendix B if you want to know more about that. There's a nice little function in the car package called delta method. Um, you know, sometimes in my classes when I teach this, I'll, I'll, I, I will uh, talk about the delta method function. Other times I don't, and I just chose in this particular semester I don't, so that I can talk about other stuff. Uh, but you know, there are details in the book. I think the first time I ever use it is maybe chapter two exercises. Um, and obviously uh, there's the code available too. Okay, so let's look at a simpler model. Let's say that I only have density in the model. And the reason why I'm going to look at a simpler model is I want to show you a graph of what this model will look like. So one could use the multi -known function. Again, my code is in the program that actually does this. I get these estimated models. And then I use the curve function, just like what we did in chapter two when we were applying logistic regression models. I use the curve function to plot my model. And this is what I get, kind of interesting looking. So I've color coded the lines corresponding to healthy sprout and scab. We have x axis, uh, on the x axis we have density, on the y axis we have pi hat. So the estimated probability of being in a category. So what we see for low density values, and remember what we saw in that plot, for low density values, the highest probability corresponds to scab. For high density values, the highest probability corresponds to health. Again, think back to the, to the um, uh, parallel coordinates plot. And then in the middle, we have sprout. Now these lines are drawn from the smallest, let's say, density value for sprout, which was about 0.9, on up to about 1.35, the highest value for sprout, for density. Because, of course, you don't want to extrapolate beyond the range of your observed data. That's why I cut off those lines at those particular values. And so it's a very interesting plot to, to help you see what these pi hats look like. Now there will be some other, so, so we can see that in all cases, I'm sorry, for all three types of wheat, um, healthy sprout and scab, there's always going to be an, a density value where you know, at least one of them has the highest probability. This is not necessarily always going to be the case in every single multinomial regression model. There could be cases where you know, one, one category can't always have a lower value than some other category. Well, you could also do a plot like this, too, if you had more than just density in the model. The key, though, is that you're going to have to condition on particular values of these ex other explanatory variables. So perhaps maybe, you know, like, like, let's say, look at the mean size, look at the mean moisture, set those as constants, and then also do that plot as a function of density. Okay, so let's talk about odds ratios. So just like with logistic regression models, our interpretations of these models will be based upon odds ratios. Well, why? Well, again, look what we're modeling. The log of an odds of j versus 1. That's what we're modeling. So it makes sense. So let's consider again the model that has only one explanatory variable in it, x. I could rewrite the model so that I have just the odds on the left side, and I have e raised to the beta j0 plus beta j1 times x on the right side. Okay, so I have the odds on the left side. And, you know, back in chapter 2, we said, okay, well, let's look at, let's say, two possible levels of x. We could look at a c, inc c unit increase in x. Take the ratio of those two odds that you get, and there's your odds ratio. And look at what our odds ratio ends up being for a C unit increase in X. E raised to the C times beta J1. Just like what we had in chapter two, essentially. Note the interpretation here. The odds of a category J versus a category one response change by that numerical value times for every C unit increase in X. Same interpretations in chapter, chapter 2, except 
I have to specify which categories I'm talking about. Before we would say the odds of success, because we knew that we were comparing them to failure. Well, what if, though, I don't want to uh, compare to category one? Maybe I want to compare category three to category two. Or more generally, how about we say category J to J prime? Well, remember what happened to our model. We talked about this um, at the end of class last time. You just simply rewrite your model in a certain way so that now you end up having the differences of your original betas as the coefficients of x. And so that now my odds ratio is e raised to the c times beta j1 minus beta j prime 1. As I say here, make sure you can show this. It could be on a test. Well, what if I had you know, other explanatory variables in my model, my model? Does the same odds ratio hold true for that? Yeah, just like in chapter two. Except for now you have to add in your interpretation, you know, holding the other variables in your model constant. Well, what if though you had interactions or transformations of explanatory variables in the model? What do you do? Same as in chapter two. Now, you know, unfortunately the interpretation becomes a little bit more complicated, but it's the same, basically the same, same stuff that we learned in chapter two. What about confidence intervals? Well, you can form walled intervals, uh, and you can form likelihood ratio intervals. Unfortunately, again, since MC profile doesn't work with this, we're not going to be doing likelihood ratio. But at least the concept of how to do it, you should have an understanding of how that could be done. Okay, so let's go back to the weak kernel data example again. This is, let's see, yeah, we're on page 37. <clears throat> okay, so we have six variables. One is, is, is categorical in nature. Soft red winter wheat versus hard red winter wheat. So in that case, C is going to be equal to 1. We have five other variables that are essentially continuous. So we need to figure out, well, what do I use for C? And now, in actual practice, what you would do is you know, go to the subject matter researcher who's studying this, the grain scientist, and say, what do you think would be a meaningful value C? Well, unfortunately, we can't go to Kansas State right now and ask that person. So what we could do instead, and I think as kind of a default is, well, think in terms of standard deviations. How about we take C for each of those explanatory variables to be one standard deviation? Seems like a reasonable thing. So that's what I'm going to do here. Okay. So how do I get these standard deviations quickly, first of all? Okay. Obviously, to do a standard deviation, there's the SD function, right? We see, saw that um, in the intro to R notes. Um, now my data, uh, where uh, that contain well, my data <laughs> is is in uh, uh, a data frame called wheat. And let's take a look at wheat once more. Okay, so what I need to do is find the standard deviation of columns two through 6. So what I could do is simply say 2 to 6 and then use that with what's called the apply function. Because basically what I want to do is apply the standard deviation function that we have to column 2, to column 3, to column 4, 5, and 6. So the way the apply function works is that the x argument is your data, the fun uh, argument is function, and then how do you want to apply this function? And there's an argument called margin, and if I say margin equal 2, that means columns. If I see, say margin equal 1, I will be doing rows. So I apply this and put the results into sd.wheat. And here are my standard deviations. Real quick. 
Now what I actually have in the notes is this, negative C um, parentheses 1 comma 7. I will get exactly the same results. Does anyone know what this negative sign does? It, it takes out columns 1 and 7. So essentially it's like a negate. Well, no, I don't want to call it negate. Um, it basically says don't do column 1, don't do column 7, but do everything else. So, uh, you know, both ways that I just presented are equal. And then what I'm going to do is put all these standard deviations together with the value of 1. Because remember, my first variable in my model is that class, soft red winter wheat or hard red, red winter wheat. And so here are all my C values that I'm going to be working with. Okay. Next, I need to somehow take C times my beta hats. The way to extract the beta hats is a little bit different from what we've seen before. We can't say mod.fit dollar sign coefficients. Rather, we have to use a, a method function called coefficients. So if I say coefficients mod.fit, this is what I get. Now notice how it's structured. Row 1 contains all the beta hat 2 values. Row 3, I'm sorry, row 1 contains all the beta hat 2 values. Row 2 contains all the beta hat 3, and then, you know, 1, 2, 3, and so on values. So, what I'm going to do is extract from column, from, I'm sorry, row 1, columns 2 through 7, and put that into something called beta hat 2. Of course, I don't need that intercept when I do these odds ratios. It, doesn't, it always falls out, so I'm just going to leave that out there. Do the same thing with beta hat 3. And let's do our, our, our odds ratios. So C dot value contains all my C's in exactly the same order as my corresponding beta hats. So if I simply multiply the two together, how R reacts is, I should do it this way, The way that R reacts is it takes 1 times negative 0.648, you get negative 0.648. It's going to take the standard deviation for density times the beta hat for density, you get negative 2.83. Okay, I'm almost there. Now I just use the XP function with it. So now I can find then my estimated odds ratio for a C unit increase in the corresponding X and I rounded two decimal places to make it um, nice. Okay. So my odds ratio for density. When I increase density by 0.13, my odds ratio is 0 0.06. Remember what this is comparing. It's comparing scab in the numerator to um, healthy in the denominator. So what this says is that the estimated odds of being scab versus healthy are 0 0.06 times for a 0.13 unit increase in density. Okay. So why is the estimated odds less than 1? Remember what we have been seeing, that as a density increases, the probability of being healthy increases. So that means then the corresponding odds ratio has to be less than 1. That's why that occurs. Of course, though, then you might be thinking, okay, well, we could invert that odds ratio as well. And that's what I do very shortly here. Let me go to my notes. Okay, so I do this for J comparing scab versus healthy. This is on page 38. Notice when we invert the density odds ratio, we get 17.04. So what that says is that the odds of being healthy are a lot higher than for being scab when density increases by one standard deviation. And that matches what we've seen in the book. Also notice how for weight, look at that as well, 9.9. .9. That matches what we were seeing in the plot too. We could do the same thing for sprout versus healthy. 
and you see somewhat similar results. Most, for example, for density. Okay, so bottom page 38, I've already kind of done those interpretations. I have a question. Yeah. When, so these are in odds ratios, when they are, when they are in pies, would we, would we um, interpret the results as um, the probability, the change in probability with with C unit increase or well I mean you know we're, 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 we're talking about odds okay and you know originally when we were talking about odds you know we had uh, two categories and you were comparing let's say the probability of success to the probability of failure which was pi over 1 minus pi now we have more than two categories, but the same essential definition holds, and you just have to specify what categories you're talking about. You know, perhaps what you're getting confused with is uh, the relative risk. Now, what the relative risk is comparing is not necessarily the, the probability of, you know, the same, resp I'm sorry, the odds ratio, I'm sorry, the odds is comparing the, pro the probabilities for two possible responses. What a relative risk does, it compares for the same response. And remember, we're looking at the relative risk for, with respect to a success. It compares the same kind of response over different uh, levels of an explanatory variable. I don't know. Uh, this, this, uh, these are in, in terms of odds ratios, but we can. These are odds ratios, yes. But we can transform this to pies. To probability. Well, I mean, you could you could find, let's say, the probability of being healthy, um, you know, uh, for um, a particular value of x, just like what we had done mm -hmm. you know, about 15 minutes ago. Yeah. So, how would we interpret that probability? Would we say the probability of um, of being healthy for an x unit increase or okay. So if, if you want to, let's say, compare it, let's say, different values of x, so you might be looking like this. So pi hat, let's say, healthy. Mm -hmm. And let's say that we have one explanatory variable. We'll call it x. And we'll add a c units to it. You want to do that comparison, right? You could do it. Just realize, though, now that this ratio that you're taking here is changing as a function of x. Because we don't have this nice simplifications that we were having with the odds ratios. Um, so, I mean, this essentially is just like a relative risk that you're doing there. You know, think about what we did in chap um, section 1.2. You know, we were saying, let's compare the probability of success for two different rows of our contingency table. In other words, you can say two different levels of your um, explanatory variable. Translating that to a more general setting where you have x, which could be, let's say, continuous, you know, we have something like this. And you could do this actually with logistic regression too. The problem is that you don't have those nice simplifications that we were having before where x would fall out. Here, x will always be there. So you would have to interpret this for, let's say, x for, let's say, x was density, for a density of 0.1. You also have to interpret for a density of 0.2. You also have to interpret for a density of 0.3. All those different values there are probably, probably going to change in terms of those, those ratios. That's why we look at odds ratios instead, where that doesn't happen. Where it's for any, any x, it doesn't matter, for this particular c unit increase, in X, we always get this particular odds ratio. You know, uh, you know, probably from a standpoint of before you came into this class, you know, you probably, you know, you would probably want to approach it from from the pi point of view, because I think that's what we're all used to seeing, because we know pi is between zero and one. But remember, all that an odds is is just a transformation of a, of, a, of a probability, 
And so it just gives you a, a different way to look at it and to reach the exact same kinds of conclusions. Just obviously your interpretations would be different for odds and probabilities. Does that help, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? There's actually an exercise in Chapter 2 that looks at how one can find um, essentially like a relative risk with a low, with low, in a logistic regression setting and also to find then the corresponding um, uh, confidence interval as well. There's an exercise on that if you wanted to look at it in more detail. It's not usually a topic that I talk about too much. I think I talked about it once in a class like this before. Okay. So um, suppose you wanted to do estimated odds ratios for sprout versus scab. On your own, you know, make sure that you can do that. You know, basically it's gonna have you're gonna have those, you have you have in my program this beta hat two this beta hat three where you're going to have to subtract them and then you know use this the exp function with that along with the c vector as well to get odds ratios to compare uh, those uh, those two well what about confidence intervals well there you can use the conf in function for walled confidence intervals associated with a, uh, a, a, a fit from um, a multinomial regression model. So, you know, it's simply use confint, object equal mod dot fit, the confidence level is 0.95. And so what we get are confidence intervals for beta. So, for example, the 95% confidence interval for the, the beta 2, 0 is 1.95 is less than beta 2, 0 is less than 0.65. That's a 95% interval. Um, now, take a look at how this is organized. So we have scab here. We have sprout there. So, you know, these are for the beta 2, oh, I'm going to call them R's. These are for the beta 3 R's. We want to find, let's say now, walled confidence intervals for the odds ratio. So what would you do? Well, in the case of, for the class variable, that's all you would do. For the other explanatory variables, you would have to multiply by C, just like what we did in chapter two. Now to actually do this, let's say more of an auto, in an automatic manner in, in R, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Let's take a look at how to do this. Okay, so I'm going to find the confidence intervals for beta first using the confident function. There's my confidence intervals. Now the way that this is stored into, in R is basically in a three-dimensional array. You know, we've seen arrays a little bit back in section 1.2. We were finding two, uh, two by two contingency tables. You know, arrays allow you to store stuff, let's say, in, higher, in a higher dimension, not just, let's say, rows and columns. You could do rows, columns, and strata. And so if I want to, let's say, extract just the confidence intervals for beta 2r, I can say conf.beta. I'm going to just get the, the, the uh, intervals for the betas, excluding the intercept, because remember, the intercept doesn't matter for us with respect to a confidence interval for um, an odds ratio. I'm going to take the first two columns. Again, look how it's stored. We have two columns of information there. And then I'm going to add a third dimension, one. And what that's going to pull out, so look at, look at for scab, negative 1.95 to 0.65, negative 1.95 to 0.65. So it pulled out just what we had saw labeled as scab. So in other words, the intervals for beta 2R. Then 
I can take my C values times my thing that I had just pulled out. And the way that R does this, um, this calculation is really nice. It's going to take the first value in C here, and it's going to multiply it by both the, uh, the first, um, first element here and then the second element there. Next, it's going to take the second value in C, and it's going to multiply it by the density, the lower bound, and also the upper bound. If that's not 100% clear, try it out yourself and you see that. Once I do that, I can use the EXP function to find my confidence intervals. So, my odds ratios for comparing scab to healthy right there for a C unit increase in the explanatory value. Look at the intervals that contain 1 and those that don't contain 1. So, for example, for density, the interval does not contain 1. Again, that relates back to what we saw in that plot. That density really mattered with respect to scab versus healthy. Uh, the interval for weight does not contain 1 either. So, how can we interpret this for density? With 95% confidence, the odds of a scab instead of a healthy response change by 7.64 to 38 times when densities decrease by 0.1. So all I did was I inverted the odds ratio while holding the other variables constant. Now we would also want to do a comparison of sprout versus healthy. And in fact, we would want to do a comparison of scab versus sprout. Um, as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there any questions? Okay. So make sure that you can do the confidence intervals for uh, scab versus sprout too. Make a note to myself there. Okay, so the next section. So we're going to talk about contingency tables. You can model the counts in a contingency table, or equivalent, let's say, the model the probabilities in a contingency table using these multinomial regression models. In fact, we can come up with a hypothesis test for independence, just like what we saw earlier, last time, in fact, um, uh, last class, by using a multinomial regression model. So, let's say we have one explanatory variable x that represents our row variable. Now, this is going to be a categorical explanatory variable. So how are we going to represent that categorical explanatory variable in R? We create indicator variables. How is R going to create indicator variables? Well, remember the baseline variable, I'm sorry, the baseline level is going to uh, be um, uh, all zeros in terms of our indicator variables. And then um, the uh, then the row two through i are going to have their own indicator variables. Our response variable y is going to know which column you fall in. So this is then a multinomial regression model to model the probabilities associated with the contingency table. Notice here my indicator variables. The subscript there, I purposely numbered them corresponding to the row number to help you out. Well, what would the model though look like, let's say, if you had independence? Well, what that says is what happens with x is not going to affect y. In other words, all of these x's here disappear from the model. So our model under independence between x and y just remove all those x's. In other words, the betas are set equal to zero. So that's your model for independence. So if I want to do a test for independence, I could write it out in terms of these two models, the hypotheses, or I could just write it out in terms of well, which betas are set equal to zero. And so how do you think you could do this in R? 
use a Likert ratio test, estimate the two models, or maybe just estimate the, the I guess the, the alternative hypothesis model, use the capital ANOVA function, or you could estimate both models and you use the little ANOVA function, and that will give you a hypothesis test for independence. And in fact, the Likert ratio test statistic that you get here, this negative two log lambda, will be exactly the same as what we had last time. The advantage that this model is going to give you is that you're going, if you reject, um, if you, if you reject uh, independence, you're going to have a convenient way to calculate, <laughs> I'm not done yet. Um, you're going to have a convenient way to come up with odds ratios and interpret that dependence. And then I'll say one last point before we go. Well, what happens if you have a, a larger contingency table? Not just rows and columns, but maybe, let's say, strata. So you have a three-dimensional contingency table. Well, how could you test for independence? Well, just put another set of indicator variables in there for that third explanatory variable and do that. If you just were to look at it in a contingency table structure like we did in section 3.2, it's not as easy. So that's why we look at models. Okay, we are one minute over. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.